Okay, let's start. Hi, guys. Very proud to see so many people here at J Prime today. My name is Stefan Minev, and I'm a Java developer. I work for a large company called PaySafe that is dealing with online payments. And I'm mainly working on uh, Java backend applications. Those are applications that are meant to be used by many, many customers. And this implies multiple, multiple requests per second. And in the traditional, most common thread per request model, this is causing a lot of troubles. I suppose that most of you are doing probably the same thing and face similar problems if you're still using request per thread model. And we are in a constant quest for finding new technologies that will magically resolve our issues with this model. And today, I'm going to present you one solution. It's a library called Quasar, implemented by a company called Parallel Universe. And it's basically about lightweight, highly performant threads for the JVM. So for the presentation, we have two parts. First one will be brief overview of the technology, and the second part will be a demo. So why, why do we like Java so much? Because it's very easy to use. It's easy to use, and it generally abstracts us from the operating system and from the bare metal. It also manages our memory. But this abstraction is not complete, not at all. We have the threads, and those threads are mapped one-to-one -to, -one to the OS threads. So now we have concerns. Why don't we have threads that are implemented in the JVM and managed entirely in the JVM? And actually, we did. There were so-called green threads back in the days that were entirely managed by the JVM. But the implementation faced some problems. Uh, all threads were multiplexed in only one. All green threads were multiplexed in only one uh, OS thread. And this way, Java uh, couldn't benefit from the multi-core multi processors. And they abandoned this implementation. And we are now with one-to-one -one mapping between Java threads and kernel threads. And, of course, the implementation was abandoned, but the idea is still alive, because we obviously do need some solution. And today I'm going to present you one possible solution, and these are these fibers. So what are these fibers? First, what is a thread? A thread is just a continuation that is scheduled to be run on a CPU core. And then what is continuation? It's just a program counter that marks our position in the sequence of instructions, plus a stack that holds out the values of our variables. And what are fibers? Fibers are threads, but implemented in bytecode for the JVM instead of the OS kernel. And why should we use fibers instead of threads? Because threads are expensive, everybody knows. It takes CPU to switch between threads, going from user mode to kernel mode, just like this things that we generally should not care when we are Java programmers. Uh, also, the, th the threads are scheduled by a general purpose scheduler. And this scheduler doesn't care if you're watching a movie or you're making application transaction. This is making it ineffective in our application layer at some point. And because threads occupy memory and CPU time, there, these are our resources, which are bounded, and we can have only a few thousand threads. On the contrary, fibers are very cheap. Actually, there is almost no penalty for task switching when you use fibers. And you understand why again with this demo. At least this is what I hope. And furthermore, fibers are scheduled, not by a general purpose scheduler, but by a for join thread pool scheduler that implements very efficient work stealing algorithm. This is our well-known for join scheduler that we even have in Java 8. And this scheduler is very good for application transactions. 
This is the default implementation. It could be changed anytime. Even you can write your own scheduler. And one more thing. Uh, the guys from Parallel, Parallel Universe say that one fiber occupies only 400 bytes of memory, so we, have, we can have millions of them. So something very important now. Uh, how do fibers work? Okay, so this is very simple code here. I hope you see it well. I'll briefly explain how they work, because this will help me later in the demo. Uh, we are basically creating one new fiber, passing it a runnable, and start it. Does it look familiar to you? Uh, similar to threads, with some very brief differences. We pass suspendable runnable instead of runnable, and the difference is that this runnable, it also has only run method, but it uh, throws one special exception called suspend execution. And later you'll understand why this exception is so special. Apart from this, it looks like thread. So, how it works? When we call the start method of the fiber, actually, the fiber is packaged, the, the runnable of the fiber is packaged in a standard uh, fork join task. And this task is scheduled for execution on our fork join scheduler. And when the time comes, the task is executed. So, here we have one, uh, several lines of very simple code. We take the current milliseconds, we print before suspension, then we call this special method, and then we print uh, again the variable. This is the code that we write, but as you know, the JVM does not support natively fibers. This is a separate library called Quasar, and it's implemented with additional bytecode manipulation. So along with our code, there is some bytecode that is added by the library. Actually, at three places. So, when we execute the runnable, uh, the, first, the first instrumentation is when we resume, so we skip it for now. So we execute the line of code with milliseconds, we print it out, then this second instrumentation, just before the fiber slip method, it actually captures our local variable. So this mills, second, mills variable it will be captured and stored in a stack. Fibers are keeping their own stack. Then we go into this fiber sleep method, and this method is called suspendable. It's suspendable because it's a suspended execution of the current fiber. Actually, it does two things. First thing is it creates a new task for the same runnable, and it schedules it to be executed after three seconds, because this is what we want. And the second thing is it calls one special method internally called fiber park that parks the fiber. So the actual suspend execution method is fiber park, but fiber sleep calls this method. So each method that calls a method that suspends the fiber is called suspendable. And this way, all methods in the chain that end up with suspendable method are also alternatively suspendable. This is important because we have to identify all suspendable methods, so they have to be instrumented. And how fiber park code by fiber sleep suspend the execution of the current fiber with throwing this suspend execution exception. The exception pop-ups up to our fiber and rewinds the stack. Uh, this, this is a checked exception, but you won't be able to catch it on your own. It's not supposed to be catched. Even if you write catch throwable, you won't be able to catch it because the instrumentation takes care of this. It will prevent you from catching it, and you're not supposed to. So three seconds after that, our task will be executed then, again, because we scheduled it before. And we'll get inside this runnable again from the first line. And here comes the first instrumentation. It already have remembered where we suspend it. So it will automatically skip the second and the third line and jump to the fiber sleep method and return immediately. And then comes the third instrumentation it will get the variables from the stack, this mills variable from the stack, applied, and you print it. So if there was no instrumentation here, we would have different values for mills because we actually execute this task twice. But now, because we resumed the exa exact suspension point, we have only one. So this is the result. 
This is how fibers work. You execute code until you suspend the fiber. It's a blocking operation. And then when there is some result, we again execute the task of the fiber, but we resume from the place where we were left the first time. The stack, we got our var variables from the stack, and we continue with the execution. From our point of view, it's simple and synchronous. But underneath, it's asynchronous. I told you that we need to identify those suspendable methods because the Kuzar library will need to instrument them. And there are some ways how to, how to do this. The first is to add to the method signatures throw suspend execution exception. The second one is to annotate the method to suspendable. Those things I'll show in the demo. The third one is to list all methods that we want in those two files, suspendables and suspendable supers. This applies when you want to instrument methods that are not part of your application but from a library that you're using. And there is also untask that fills one of those files for you. And there is untask, the same untask in, um, in another mode that will traverse all calls and will suspend the methods. And you have, don't have to do anything. This will do anything for you, but it will end up instrumenting a lot more than needed. Uh, so the preferred ways are the first and the second one and third for libraries. And how the bytecode instrumentation is performed? Again, some ways. The first, most preferred one is by using Java agent that will instrument the code on the fly. I'll show this in the demo. The second one is a head of time instrumentation by Antask. Who is using Ant these days? By Antask uh, that will instrument just after compilation. And the first, the preferred method to Java agent actually works only for uh, Java executables and embedded containers. And if you want to use standalone container, for now JT and Tomcat are supported, uh, then you have to use a special class holder. And there are some caveats when using fibers. Runaway fibers, those are fibers that are stuck in infinite loop. Basically, it's not a good idea, but Kozar will handle it. Because our four joint thread pool executor, it actually uh, creates as many threads as your cores. On my machine, it, it's always with four threads because it's four cores. And if you block one core, the other one thread of the executor, the other three are working and still scheduling and executing fibers. Uh, thread locals. The interesting thing is that thread locals work as expected. You can use them as you do now because Kozar takes care to copy the thread vocals from the thread and put them in the fiber. And when it's sus suspended and resumed, it will copy them back. So thread vocals work OK. Synchronized and blocking thread calls, those are blocking the thread, not a good idea. By default, not allowed. But Kozar can handle them, and you can force it to start with those calls. Just has to have to pa uh, pass additional parameter. One very interesting concept. And here we'll talk a little bit about the Go language. It's Google language that is uh, out there for several years. Very good, very interesting language. It leverages a lot of ideas, interesting concepts. And one of them is how do we communicate basically between threads? We share one data structure, and then we synchronize access to, those data, to this data structure. So we access it from different threads. And then we suffer. <laughs> and then, the, here the idea is different. We communicate by sharing data, uh, by sending data, not by sharing data. And these are channels. Channels are conduits between threads or fibers or go routines in the case of Go, and we send data through these conduits, these queues. So a little bit of Go language here, just a few lines. What we're doing here, we create a channel, then we create a go routine. Go routine is their abstraction for threads. Then we send something through this channel. And here we receive the message from the channel and we print it. And why the hell I'm showing go code here on a Java conference? Because now the Java code is very close to go. We create a channel. Then we spawn a fiber. We send something for, to this channel. And then we receive something from the channel. Exactly the same concept following the same principles. Who is using ACA here? OK, not many guys, but probably you're the smartest. 
interesting framework. <laughs> I personally don't want to use it. It's probably clever than me, or smarter. Uh, but you can take a look at the Kozar implementation. It uh, supports uh, the actor model as it is in Erlang. And the API is simple because it's, um, it's fiber blocking instead of callback based. You should definitely take a look. A uh, few words about another library, not library, but another project called Comsat. Actually, this is everything that you need in order to, you, to use fibers in your day-to-day -day work. These are integrations with technologies that we like. And when you use this integration, you actually use your favorite technology, but with fibers instead of threads. You can see what supports serverless, JAXRS, the JERS implementation, HTTP clients, database access, Spring, etc. The ones that are both, I'll show in the demo. So in order to activate fibers in this technology, you just have to add this dependency. And your favorite technology will be fiber aware. Just a few words about JDBC. JDBC does not support asynchronous API. There is no asynchronous API of JDBC. And what fibers do in all of these technologies, use their synchronous blocking APIs, which tend to be simpler, but under the covers, COSAR will use their non-blocking asynchronous APIs and to start to spend fibers for you. So it will take away the complexity. And JDBC doesn't have this API, so basically using JDBC you won't gain any anything when used with fibers. Okay, let's switch to the demo. There I'm showing you one very simple, uh, one very simple application, Spring Boot enabled. We are using Maven here. These days, Gradle is uh, more fashionable, but now it will be Maven. So nothing special here. A simple Spring Boot application. We are using Jetty. Uh, the only difference is that we need to add the Comsat Spring Boot integration. So we will be fiber enabled. Uh, we need dependency to Kazar core, and this is for the server side and for, for the client side for the sake of the demo. We add um, the fibers implementation, not implementation, fibers integration with the Apache HTTP uh, client. And as I promised, there are two interesting here, uh, things here. In the Maven exec plugin, we will need to add the Java agent. And this is actually our Quasar core jar. So on the fly, it will instrument our code. And we do the same thing in the Surefire plugin, so we can benefit from it for the tests. So first, normal Spring Boot application. We have one controller using Jetty. We have one controller. And this control, controller has only two methods two endpoints. One of them is this hello J-Prime stuff, and it basically does simple things. It does some logging first, then it performs long lasting blocking operation. I probably, you, you can imagine what this thing do. Yeah, we sleep, this is what we usually do. And the interesting here is that we use strength sleep. What is a strength? The strength is either a thread or a fiber. It's abstraction above them. So if you are in context of threads, not using fibers at all, it will be thread. This will call threads. If we are with fibers, this will call fiber sleep. So we wait three seconds for each request, and then we return this great string. And we walk some response metrics, and we return response. The other endpoint is just to dump the current threads of Jetty. And you, I'll show you why in a second. The next thing that we're going to do is actually to cripple Jetty. Jetty is pretty survivable, so we try hard to keep cripple it. Basically, Jetty use Qt thread pool, uh, and we will try to set not so many threads to its pool, so it will be crippled, and we will sim simulate peaks in the traffic. We will actually use seven threads for Jetty. You'll see why. Okay. So let's start the application. Yeah, 
it will take just a second to start. As we know, Spring Boot is very fast. There will be new versions, as we understood today. Okay, it started. The first thing that we're going to do is to check Jetty. Did we manage to cripple it? The, this thing is just calling our Jetty dump endpoint to see what happens with Jetty. I'm not sure if are, you're aware of what happens, uh, how Jetty works. What happens, you're probably not aware because I'm going to explain. <laughs> uh, Jetty has actually three kinds of threats. One, uh, the first kind is acceptors. They just accept the connection. The other kind are selectors. They react on I.O. events and they delegate the actual work to the third kind of threats that probably only I call workers. I don't know, probably this is the name, but those are the threat, threats that work. And we have two selector threads, one acceptor, and the other four threads are our worker threads. Okay, so let's put some burden on this crippled jetty. For now, don't pay much attention. I'll just tell you that I will send 60, 60 requests to, to the jetty server. Let's see what will happen here. So we have four threads that are doing the job. And each request takes three seconds. And we are making 60 simultaneous requests. Can you do the math? What will happen here? How much time it will take? Here you can take a look. We sent four requests, and they occupy our, all our threads. And Three seconds later, we got our responses. And all other 54 requests are queued by Jetty. They are not rejected. And whenever we have a spare thread, Jetty um, assigns a request to it, so it could be handled. And with this crippled Jetty, what we actually did is around 45 seconds. This is the math. So, we managed to serve these 60 requests in 45 seconds. And now imagine that this is your thread per request application on production handling your traffic at the peak time, probably the, the Black Friday or something else. Not very good. Okay. It suffers. Let's kill it. Okay. So now, now the real deal. The same application, I'm not going to change the code. Same synchronous controller. We don't, not, don't put anything. Async, annotations, different responses, nothing. The response is the same. Uh, the, the code is the same. The only thing that I'm going to do is to use the constant integration of Spring Boot. Just to change the, change the annotation and to start over. Oh. One thing that I forgot. Uh, we crippled Jetty, but I think that it's not enough because we are now showing new technology fibers and we said that it's not using those threads. So let's not only cripple Jetty, but probably break his knees or something else. Let's leave it with only four threads. What happened now? Let's just check if JT accepted what we wanted. Okay, only four threads. Again, one selector, one acceptor thread, two selector threads, and only one thread that can link request. But it's okay. We we don't even need this one thread. It's there because if it's not there, JT won't start. And what we're going to do now, we'll send again those requests. Okay, what happened now? 
as you can see here from the server walk, all 60 requests arrived at the same time. There are no four requests, then four, then four, then four. All requests are here. And three seconds later, we got all our 60 responses back to us. So it took around three seconds, a little bit more, but three and something, to handle all these requests. And we handled them with only four threads. And those are the threads that come with the scheduler of, uh, of Kozar. And I'll show you something very interesting here. Uh, one, some of the requests, for example, let, let's take a look at this request and response. It actually started in one thread, in this third thread. But then it ended on the first one. So this is what I showed you with the suspension. At the point when we suspended the executions, in order to, to wait for three seconds, we were scheduled, and when time came, we were assigned to a different thread. So we didn't block any threads here. The code was the same, same simple blocking code that we were used to write, write every day, but under the covers, because they are the heavy lifting for us, and translates everything to asynchronous performant code. Okay, let's leave with the Quasar implementation on the server and go to the quant side. See some interesting stuff there. What we are going to do next, I'll show you how from the quant side you can use HTTP quant. For the purpose of this session, we are using the Apache HTTP quant. What we're doing in this code, we create a simple Apache HTTP quant, synchronous and blocking. This closable HTTP quant Abstract class is basically the HTTP one interface plus, plus closable interface, nothing special. Then we create a list with callables that are tasks, our tasks. Then we create executor service with number of threads equal to the half of our request, so 30 threads in our case. Then we measure the time, and then we create 60 tasks and then we submit all those tasks to the executioner service. This simple, this is something that we do from Java 6 up to now. So let's run it and see how it works. Nothing special here. We are using the normal blocking calls, not in case synchronous. So what happened here? We have, we managed to do our job in six seconds. And we used 30 threads, 30 threads to handle our 60 requests. And we did it in, in six seconds. It's not bad, but 30 threads for 60 requests, come on. Uh, not very good. Let's try with fibers now. Let's take a look here at the code. Does it sound familiar? It's very close to the code both. So we create HTTP fiber enabled client. The same client as before, we use the same interface, but now it's aware of fibers in this ComSat integration. Then we create, create a list of futures, and then we create new fibers and put them in this list. A list of futures and we put fibers, this is because fibers implement the future interface. And here, we don't even bother to find executor service or something else. We just create fibers on the fly because they are very cheap, 400 bytes. We create them, start them, and that's it. And then we wait for all of them to see what happens. What actually this code and this code are doing, here in Kovo, here in suspendable Kovo, difference again is only that suspendable callable throws suspend execution exception, is the same thing. Here we send a request using HTTP client, here we send a request using fiber HTTP client. One thing that I'm going to show here, actually this will be our suspend suspendable method that you suspend execution. Uh, what does this send request do? It, do? it does the same thing for both implementations, the normal HTTP client and the fiber enabled. It does some logging, uh, then it actually calls 
this abstraction to make HTTP call, and then it some returns some results. What is uh, important here is that we has, have to mark it. So this method should be instrumented. This fiber-enabled method, it's spendable, it should be instrumented, and we mark it with draws exception. Let's see this abstraction here. It's nothing more than an interface that I put, and here we, it also has to be extracted because we suspend through it. The actual implementation is the one that will suspend the execution, but we also have to take because this interface is suspended. And here we don't want to put exceptions in the interface, so we will take us to implement to instrument it by adding this annotation. So these are two methods, two most important methods that you can use to make Ozar instrument your spendable uh, methods. And what it, what it does inside, very simple thing. It just exec calls execute on the HTTP client. As I promised, no callbacks, no asynchronous requests, nothing. We just call the normal, synchronous, blocking API of the HTTP client. And that's it. Okay. Let's run it to see what happens here. Okay, so what, what happened here is, if you take a look here, we basically sent all 60 requests at once, and three seconds later, yeah, three seconds later, we got all 60 responses back to us. And it took, it took a little bit more than three seconds, because each request takes three seconds. And we did it with only four threads. The threads that our fork join thread pool executor uses. So the same code, we just enabled fibers, and we got benefit in performance and less use, and better utilized usage of resources. Okay, let's go to the next demo. So the next demo is um, almost the same thing, but now instead of calling the API with HTTP quant, you, we use the REST template of Spring. Who is using REST template? Okay, not so many people. I thought that it's very useful, but probably there are better tools. Still, we'll show how it will work with REST template. So we create a new REST template, then we put our normal HTTP quant into this REST template, and the rest of the code is exactly the same. 30 track executor with 30 tracks. We create a task, we can call send request, and then we walk. I'll just run it for the, for the sake of the demo, but probably all of you can expect what will happen. Basically, the rest and plate is another abstraction of the HTTP quant, so we don't expect to be, to be faster. Yeah. And the same thing as the HTTP quant. Six seconds and 30 requests. Yeah. As expected, not special. Now, let's revise the same code with fiber-enabled REST template. The code is the same. I won't explain it again for the fourth time. The interesting thing here is that we again need to instrument our methods. But in this case, what we are calling is actually the REST template get for object. This would be our fiber-suspendable method. And we need to instrument it. And as you can think, we cannot go to the Spring source code and add the notation or throws exception. We need to go with another way, and this way is those two files, suspendables and suspendable supers. And those files should be on the class path. What we do here, we list all methods. We, for example, this first line says, instrument all methods in the rest and plate. If I want to instrument only one method, then I do it like this, specifying the method. So here we list all specific concrete implementations of the methods. In suspendable supers, we list the methods, the super methods of our methods. For example, here we can list interfaces, abstract classes, methods that we override. And when our code use those interfaces or abstract classes, the instrumentation should know uh, the, in the interfaces is suspendable and the implementation is suspendable. For example, you can take a look here at this abstract client HTTP request. 
uh, we list it in suspendable because there are implementation of the methods there that we use, but Spring used them uh, by the client HTTP request interface. So we need to put both of them, the interface in the suspendable supers and the concrete implementation in suspendables. So the code is the same, everything is the same. Just now we instrument by using those two classes plus the other instrumentation that we have for send request and uh, our abstraction of HTTP request. Yeah, let's run it. First, let's go. Again, we don't expect anything strange here. It should be around six seconds. Around three seconds, because we are with fibers now, yeah? Three seconds with four threads, same thing. Okay, let's move on with something a little or a little bit different. What we did up to now is we explained how fibers work and that we suspend execution and then we resume it back. And we, for this purpose, we rely only on the instrumentation of the bytecode instrumentation. And whenever I tried those this technology for the first time, there is also always feeling in me that this instrumentation, okay, it's tested, it seems to be working, but it's instrumentation after all. It's code that I didn't, I haven't written. It's there and it works, but there is something strange. Let's make some interesting tests. So, again, we have one fiber and we call a send request method. This time the method is a little bit different. The method just walks before we send the request, then it sends the request. This is our suspendable method that will suspend the execution. Then we walk after we receive the response. Then we walk on finally before the method exits. And then we walk again here on, in this finally when the send request method returns. And then, then we walk here when our test finishes. So what we expect to see is before sending request, after sending request, Send request method is finished, fiber finished, and then the response. Let's see how the instrumentation will work with this. Okay. So before sending request, after sending, send request method is finished, fiber finished response. Great, instrumentation works. Okay, it works, but does it really? Let's just comment one login here. The first one in, in our send request method. Let's comment it and try again. So what we expect to see now is after sending request, send request method finished, fiber finished, response. Let's check it out. The first thing that we see here is send method is finished. And three seconds later, when the fiber is resumed after suspension, we see the normal sequence of walks after sending send request method fiber. So what happened here? The first time when the fiber was suspended, we actually got this finally exec block executed. So we went to our HTTP request get method, the fiber was suspended, and the instrumentation was supposed to prevent us from this finally, but it, it didn't. We actually executed this finally twice, one when we suspended, and, and again when we were resumed. I really don't know if this is a bug or a feature, but in all cases, if you use fibers and do some uh, resource uh, re uh, releasing, disposing in the final method, you should be very careful because if you don't be careful, they could be executed twice. So, not sure. Feature or bug? Probably both. Okay. I see that we have time. Uh, so I'll briefly show you one quick demo with the channels. Channels are 
a different concept that probably most of us are, most of us are not used, but let's take a brief look here. Uh, we create a REST template as we did now with fibers, and then we create two channels. Those two channels don't have buffers. This means that we, when we send something to the channel, somebody will have to receive it. And as I said, channels are just queues. And you use those queues to send data between our fibers. Then we start two fibers, one, two. In the first fiber, we send requests using the fibers REST template. In the second case, we send requests using the fibers HTTP client. When we got the response, we just sent REST template. When we got this response, we just sent to the channel HTTP client. And here we use probably the most useful feature of channels. At first, when I saw channels, I thought that they're great, and I will start doing thinking channels. And then I started thinking about some stuff, and it turned out that there are ways to do everything without channels. And most of the most of the time, the code is simpler. But for example, this feature with the select is very interesting. What it does is basically we give a list of channels in our case two, and whichever receives first this select statement unbox. So it, it first box the execution, and it listens on both channels. And whenever one returns the value, it's unbox and gives us those value. And we just print it. So basically, we just want to see who will be first, the REST template or the HTTP client. Let's run to see what happens. So we sent two requests. We got a response, first from the HTTP client, and then the response from the REST template. And this is a useful feature of channels. We used unbuffered channels, because we sent only one thing to these channels. And when I ran this improvised test for the first time, it looked good. And then I spotted one very interesting thing. Why the hell the spring started closing the test before I got my response. I'm supposed to, everything in my test to be finished and then spring to close it. So there is something strange here. As I said, fibers uh, could be used with threads, as with fibers. So I did the same test. Actually, this test is the same as before, but with threads. And now I'll show you what I did when I saw this strange thing with closing before everything is finished. So what we're doing now, again, REST template and HTTP client. Again, our two channels. Now we create executioner service with two threads, and we submit our two requests to those threads, and then we select on the channels and wait to see what happens. And the only difference is that we now put some logging. So we walk before we send on the channel, then we send the channel, then we close the channel, then we walk that we close the channel. The same thing here. And the other thing is that we again walk who is first after the selection, and then we just dump the executioner service to see what happens. So let's run this test again. We sent two requests. Then HTTP uh, quant is faster again, sending the request, HTTP quant closed, HTTP quant is the first. Then we got the response from the REST template, and then we got REST template channel is sending, and we never closed this REST template uh, channel. I don't know if you see this spinning wheel here, but the test is not, is not finished. We, we, are still <laughs> we are still running the test. And let's see what happens. Actually, the select statement unblocked us when the HTTP client channel received data, but there is nobody listening for the other channel anymore for the REST template. So when the REST template is ready and sent its data to the channel, nobody received the data. Nobody even wished to receive the data because the select statement already unblocked us. And this thread, in this case, because with this test we use thread, and this thread remains blocked forever, 
sending this request. And do you remember then I told, that I told you that channels are queues? Okay, I li light a little bit. There are queues in most cases, but when we use unbuffered uh, channels, they're actually uh, unbuffered, unbuffered channels. They're actually the actual implementation is transfer channels. It's not queue. And what we did in the previous example that seemed to work, and we saw the, this closing after it, is we actually leaked a fiber. Or if we were using a thread, we leaked a thread. One thread remained blocked forever without anybody to receive what it sends. So, what's the cure? The cure is that you should be very careful if you use unbuffered uh, channels. So what we have to do is just put the buffer of one to the channel and let's re see what happens. Sending two requests. Okay, now everything seems okay. HTTP channel sends HTTP channel closed his first. We got also a response from the REST template which sent it's closed, everything finished. Close is after. So what happened now? Again, HTTP quant was first. REST template sent its data, but now we have buffer, we have a queue, the data is there, and the thread is released. The thread finished and was disposed, or the executor service managed it, and we didn't leak it. So again, if you're using channels, be careful with unbuffered channels. And the select table. So this was the demo. Just a few slides, not few, but finishing slides. Awesome, great technology. It works under the covers with asynchronous coding, does the heavy lifting and leaves space for us to do our simple synchronous coding as we are, as we are doing every day. It's great. This is what it does. It's not faster than asynchronous implementations because it uses them under the covers. It just gives us the ability to use our simple code without callbacks and everything that the asynchronous pro programming implies. So, leave the complexity in the parallel universe and be happy with the synchronous code. So, big question. I told you that I work for a large company and the large companies don't want to experiment with technologies that are not production ready. So, big question. Is this technology production ready and should we use it? Well, it works, I showed you each time it works. It is production ready actually. But should you use it? Basically, if you, if you are okay with uh, this bytecode instrumentation, which actually feels like a hack and looks like a hack, probably is a hack. <laughs> <laughs> if you're okay with it, then use it. It's production ready. But there is one thing here. The guys from Parallel Universe state that they're working with the JDK team. And basically what they need is a little bit more information about the Java stack trace during current time. So this instrumentation would be transparent for us and we won't need to mark these methods with suspendable annotations and stuff like this. And when this happens, or if this happens, I don't know, Java 9 will be soon here. I don't know if it's there, probably it's not or it's, it isn't, I don't know. But even if it's there, it probably won't be one of the so-called best features. It will be hidden inside. So this is our ray of hope. If actually Java reveals a little bit more about the stack trace, then this technology will be great and probably will be one of the hype technologies. So this is it for me. Now it's your turn. You have 30 seconds for questions. Are you using it for the, uh, the question is, are we using it in production? The answer is not yet. <laughs> yeah, we, we are waiting for the JDK guys to add this thing 
inside JVM, and then we will probably take a look. setting can you if you're already using something to take care of the trading model and the asynchrony for example in a net setting can you uh, somehow benefit from this technology w which setting net um, I'm not sure about netty net is about asynchronous IO I'm not sure if it uh, has implementation integration with Kozar yet it does, okay, probably it does. I haven't tried it. Because actually NETI implies complexity. We also evaluate it using NETI. And we don't only care about performance. We also care about maintenance of our code. And we don't want to imply too much uh, complexity in it. So I don't know about NETI. It, if it has uh, integration, that it will probably work. Other questions? Okay, if no more questions, then guys, the organizers told me that there is pizza, whoever is hungry, go and grab a piece. Thank you.